Uh, she was out of town last week, I think. It was Sunday, I think. But anyway, let's keep her in your prayer. I don't know if the video if the video started already. We got you. But we'll do some announcements. Number one announcement. Friday, they are starting. Uh, Kansas has ordered everybody to wear masks again in public, okay? Now, do you have anything that you want to say about masks or wearing them at church? What's the procedure? Yeah, you. I told you earlier. Like, do like a restaurant, you wear it into the building, you set social distancing six feet apart in right. your area and family unit, you can remove it. When you get up to leave, you put it back on. Okay, that's what we're going to do. I, Next time I do announcements. Well, you write them down. I, I, could, I could say all that if it was written down. So It's on our what, website. What we're going to do Sunday, it is on the website. I don't have the website pulled up right now, okay? What we're going to do Sunday is if you uh, wear a mask in, you can uh, keep it on all the service if you want, or you stay six feet apart in your family unit and you can take it off, okay? Uh, that's kind of how we're going to go about wearing masks here, okay? Now, yours truly, how many of you are completely just like, hey, pastor, I'm not wearing a mask? Just hold your hand up. Hey, pastor, I'm not wearing a mask. It's okay, okay? Nobody's going to turn you in. No, the camera didn't see you, okay? Nobody's going to turn you in. It's all right. But we are going to stay six feet apart in our family units or whatever this month. Remember how we were seeking people one end of this row, one end of that row? That's what we're going to do. We're going to alternate and make sure everybody's six feet apart. We, <coughs> we can fit <coughs> excuse me, close to 100 people in here. And still keep everybody six feet apart because we got a lot of room, okay? <laughs> so we don't have to stop having church. We just need to be smart, right? That's right. Amen. Sorry, my mouth got dry. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, next announcement. Because of uh, the uh, COVID order, we're going to continue to not have children's classes and nursery except the nursery will be open if somebody has a one of the kids that you just want to uh, you can take them in there by yourself and you can you can take them in there okay so uh, <laughs> I'm just letting you know that is available for you to do okay Judy you cannot take Mike in there and just uh, okay I'm taking that out of your hands real quick anyway uh, so, no children's classes right now, plus we're still working on this hallway roof to get it all sealed. Uh, we got, that leads right into my next announcements, I ordered all 15 buckets of rubber roofing that we need to fix the roof, and the one gallon jugs of paint thinner that goes in it, so we're going to have that possibly by Friday, that's 15 buckets of rubber and 15 buckets of thinner so we can spray it on the roof. We already tested it. We sprayed the seams on the outside of this wall and on the outside of that wall and the seam going down the middle. We know it works. We know we can do it. So now we're about to save ourselves a whole bunch of money. Now, this is a praise the Lord because we're going to be able to do the middle roof in between this building and the next building, and the roof on the next building for probably around six and a half thousand dollars. We had a company give us a quote just for the roof on the three-story building, and they wanted like forty-one thousand dollars. So we saved a bunch of money. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We saved a whole bunch of money and we're gonna we're in the process, so we're gonna set up a work day once we get all the material and tell everybody, hey, because we're gonna need, I'll tell you what we're gonna need, because 
we're going to do the landing outside that second story window is how we get out onto the roof of the hallway here, okay? So we're going to need a couple people stirring buckets of uh, paint thinner into the buckets of rubber while somebody else is spraying it and somebody else is going around with a paintbrush and getting all the little screw heads on the roof. Because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do all the seams and then get all the screw heads on that metal roof. And then the next day, once that dries, the next day we'll go by and spray all of it. One solid sheet of rubber. Sound like the plan? Amen. And then, and then that landing is going to be the last thing we do because we're going to spray our way right out of the work. You know what I mean? Because we're going to do that whole landing and then uh, the flat part of that landing, we're going to spray all of that as we're finishing up. You know what I mean? So that's going to be the last thing done and we'll just spray ourselves right back in the building and let it dry. Amen? And then we should have watertight hallway all the way down. Amen? If you don't know, and I know because a lot of you are ladies, so if you just walk a little farther past the front door and look in the men's bathroom, you'll know why we have to do the roof because it's leaking almost right over the men's toilets. So we, we got to get this fixed, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely important, amen? Uh, I think I have one more announcement. I can't remember it. Should have wrote it down. I should have wrote it down. I think that's the last one. Uh, we. Oh, no, I don't. I remember now. I remember now. Sunday, let me pull my phone out so I don't tell everybody the wrong date. Okay? Let me get my calendar out here. Hey, Jonathan, message me back. It's a 19th. Calendar. Here we go. We're in July now, right? So, Sunday, the 19th, that is July 19th. We will not be having church here on Sunday morning. We're going to go and surprise our brothers and sisters over at St. John's Church of Faith. And we're going to have church with them. Amen. Amen. Mainly because Carmen and I really love Pastor Gary and Pastor Pearly. And she gets tired of hearing me preach and wants to go hear somebody else preach. Amen. 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 Hey, it's all right to listen to other folks preach, okay? Just make sure you listen to the pastor too, okay? <laughs> and the following Sunday, Michael York will be preaching his third sermon on the next Sunday. That'll be the 26th. Why is Mike preaching on the 26th? Because I've been asked by a good friend of mine who pastored a church in Cedarville. If you don't know where Cedarville at, it's out way past Sedan, okay, on 160. Six, right? On 160 or 160. Yeah. It's over yonder. That going over there. It's over east, okay? But we're going to go over there that Sunday morning, Carmen and I, and I'm going to be preaching at Pastor Peanuts Church, and hopefully they uh, don't stone me and run me out of there. Because <laughs> I've been hitting it hard, man, with this getting down to what the Bible says, okay? So, you know, some people, you know, I know Peanut ain't going to be, but. I might, I don't know all of these people neither, you know. So just pray for me. Don't get stoned and run out of town on the rail, you know, tarred and feathered and all that. But that was my, I think that was my last two announcements is those things. Uh, if I remember another one, I'll tell you. But I think that's it, okay? Let's go ahead and pray over the offering. We're not passing the offering plate. That's my last announcement. We're not passing the offering plate while this whole COVID thing is going on. So if you want to give, it's right up front. You can give now. You can give while I'm preaching. You can give while you're walking out the front door. Okay? Doesn't matter. But just know this. We are trying to get enough money. Now, we already got the stuff for this roof over here. But we're going to be working on the next roof. Okay? So everything you give is going to go to getting that next roof sealed up so we can Get this place tore up and tore out and ready to start soup kitchens and all the other plans we got for it, right? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would 
Bless this offering that we will receive tonight. God, we will receive it gladly. Lord, those of us who have the gift, Lord, I ask that you would help us to have a good heart as we give. Lord, those who don't have the gift but have a heart to give, God, I pray that you would bless each and every one of us, God. We pray that you would take this offering, Lord, that you would use it for your glory, your honor, and that we would do your kingdom work with it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. All right, I'm going to shut my phone off now. Oh. Amen. All right. Now, it's right up there. I've been preaching on the five solas of fundamental Christianity. Okay? This is the five fundamental beliefs of almost every single Protestant denomination. And we can even got a few of these that transfer over to our Catholic brothers and sisters. Okay? So, we're not leaving them out either. Amen? Now, we are on solas Christ. In Christ alone. That's what we're finishing up. I know I, I haven't preached one whole sermon on a Sunday morning for three weeks because I haven't got through all the notes that I got for each one of them, okay? So tonight, I'm giving you my third page of notes that I didn't get through Sunday, okay? Sunday, we talked about, and I'm going to give you the groundwork uh, real quick again for solus. Christus. The word solus Christus or in Christo solo, that's the Latin form, okay? It means in Christ alone. The basic belief is that salvation is by faith in Christ alone, that is through the atoning work of Christ alone, apart from individual works that Christ is the only mediator between God and man. But I put a note in here also. It says your doctrine of salvation, rather your idea of salvation, matters. And they have a word for that, and a word I didn't give you Sunday. It's called soterology. Yeah, if you want to spell it, it is S-O-T-E-R-I-O-L-O-G-Y. Okay, soterology, that is, in other words, the study of salvation, the study of uh, salvation in religion, that there's a broad term for it, but in Christian terms, it's the soterology of Christ, amen, and how we look at Christ and look to Christ for salvation. And I also read from the 1689 uh, London Confession that says the office of mediator between God and man is proper only to Jesus Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God and may not be either in part or in whole transferred from him to anyone else. In other words, there's only one way to heaven, and the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Amen? So that's where we started Sunday, and Sunday we went through verses like John 14 and 6, where Jesus declared unto Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. So we can squash any idea that Jesus is somehow just another way to heaven. Right? Jesus isn't one of many ways to heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's Amen. the only way to get to the Father. And it's very interesting to me that Jesus tells his disciples First of all, he's telling us here in, in, in uh, John 14 and 6, he says that no one gets to the Father but by me. In John 6, he said no one comes to the Son except the Father draws him. Pretty interesting, right? There we're seeing the, the Trinity at work. God the Father drawing to the Son for salvation. The Spirit, there again, seals us 
What does it say? The Spirit baptizes us into Christ. Amen? Amen. So we can see even in salvation, we can't separate God and the Father, Son, or the Spirit. All three of them are present at salvation, before salvation, at salvation, and after salvation. Amen? It's not one or the other. It's all three of them. Amen? Uh, the verse that says there's only one mediator uh, between God and man, I'm going to touch on it, and then I'm going to turn the page, okay? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And if you need to know where 1 Timothy is, it's right after 2 Timothy, or right before 2 Timothy and right after 1 Thessalonians. If Michael's in here, he would have totally got me for messing that all up. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom to be testified in due time. Now, the reason that this verse is so important, and you can go and read that whole chapter of Timothy, and it, lie, it, it, it lays out the case that Jesus is the only way to the Father, okay? There's only one person that can mediate between you and God. Now, I know everybody likes to call the pastor and say, hey, pastor, pray for me. Now, I know when people call me and have say, hey, pray for me, they're not saying, hey, I want you to be my mediator, okay? They're just saying, I want you to agree with me in prayer, amen? And we're all good with that, right? But there are some other people, and you can go to other religions, like, you know, you get witch doctors and and if you got to have something happen in your life, you got to go to the witch doctor or you're not going to get it, right? Some religions teach stuff like that. Well, we don't have a guy on earth that we have to go to, amen? You can get saved all by yourself in your basement with no one else around, amen? I've heard stories of people just that somebody gave them a Bible and then they started reading the Bible and all of a sudden the Bible came alive to them and they understood that they needed God, and God was the only way. Jesus was the only way to get to the Father, and bam, they got saved out all by themselves with just the Bible. Amen? Well, here's a real interesting one for you. Why would that work? Well, because the Scripture says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Amen? That's how we get faith, is the Word. Amen? So we got to we have this solidified. Jesus is the only way, and he's the only mediator. So we stopped where I was just about to go into Romans, and there's a whole bunch here in Romans 5 that I want to read, okay? So if you have your Bibles, turn it to Romans chapter 5, and we're going to start reading, I think, around verse 8. Yes, let's read right here, starting at verse 8. And I'm reading out the King James, so anybody that's got the King James tonight, thank Carmen, because she bought me this giant print one that I can see real good, okay? Uh, verse 8, but God commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, Shall we be saved from wrath through him? For if we were, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life? And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. That word, the atonement, is a very important part of why Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. That word, atonement, is the, uh, the, the reason that John 14 and 6 is true. Because if Jesus would have just came and preached and healed the sick and, and raised the dead and, and, and preached all these good messages, but didn't go to the cross... 
our salvation would have never been purchased. Amen. And it ain't just that he went to the cross, it's that he overcame death in doing so. Amen? Amen. Because even the cross by itself wasn't enough because he had what the, the Bible says that he was raised for our justification. Why? Because then he could go sit at the right hand of the Father victorious and be a mediator, a lawyer, an interceder for us. The Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for the saints, right? So we know that all of those things mattered in the person and what Jesus did. The atoning work of Jesus is the only reason he is mediator at all. Amen? Matter of factly, I, you know, I talked about this Sunday too. We we have some people that kind of just say, "Lord, I don't uh, I don't worship you for what you did. I worship you for who you are." You can't separate the two because Jesus wouldn't be who He is if He would not have done what He did. You understand what I'm saying? Peter and them didn't say, "Hey, worship Jesus," because uh, just because He said so. When when they came to the Sanhedrin. And they asked him, hey, how did this guy get healed? Peter starts laying out the gospel to him. He said, you know that Jesus guy that you crucified? Well, God raised him from the dead. And it was by his sacrifice, by his blood, by his name, is this guy standing here healed right now. Amen? Amen. To, the, to the Hebrew person, understanding that Jesus was the atonement meant a whole lot more than it does to us. Because us Gentiles, we don't get it. Well, atonement, I don't need no atonement. What are you talking about atonement? Well, the Hebrews lived in a society where every single year they had to give sacrifice for their sin. Right? Every year. Multiple times throughout the year they did other things that they were required to do. But once a year was the sacrifice for sin. And everyone came back to Jerusalem and they all got them the best lamb, the best goat, the best oxen, the best cow, of their whole flock. Without spot and blemish, they took it to the temple. And if you was a lady, you went and got birds and doves and pigeons. And you found all them that were perfect. And you took them to be sacrificed, right? That's what was happening. So when the Jews heard that Jesus was the atonement, for their sins. It either made them believe or it made them hate them even more because they felt like it was blasphemy that he could do that. But Jesus did that. That's how we come to faith in him isn't because of just who he is, but what he did. Amen? You can't separate the two. We got to keep that together. The gospel itself, the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that while we were still sinners, right, like we just read here in Romans 5, while we were still sinners, verse 8, right, he said, God, Jesus died for us, amen? Man, this fan is messing me up. It keeps blowing my foot shut. Here, I'm going to shut this off. Hold on. Is that all? I don't know which way it's on. Zero. It's on. I couldn't see through the fan. <laughs> Here we go. He says, he says in Romans 5, verse 8, where we just read, but God commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that right there is another thing that we need to start talking about in the gospel a whole lot more. We, we got this gospel being preached now that, man, if you just get your life straightened up, God ain't worried about you straightening your life up. God wants to straighten your life up for you. Amen. Amen. That's the gospel truth. All of us, while we were, Ephesians 2, when it starts out, it says we're dead in our trespasses and sin. Amen. How many of you ever seen a dead person do anything? Huh? I worked at a morgue or at a nursing home, or not a nursing home, a funeral home. That's what I'm trying to say. I worked at a funeral home, and they had a morgue, right? 
keep all these bodies in there. You know what? I was always really scared going in there doing stuff, and somebody was going to just grab me. Or this. But you know what? Nobody ever did. Why? Because they're dead. And when you're dead and your trespass is in sin, you can't save yourself. It's impossible. You're not going to fix you. You can try to do all the good things you want to do, but it's not going to fix what's wrong. And what's wrong is the heart. Our heart is deceitful above all things. Don't ever do what other people tell you to do all the time. Just follow your heart. You better not follow your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. And who shall know it? Okay? Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, Ezekiel said that God came and he wants to put a new heart in us, right? He wants to take out the heart of stone, put in the heart of flesh, and cause us to do his will and obey his statutes, right? Notice that I'm not going to obey his statutes. I'm not going to do his will. I'm not going to live right if my heart ain't right. Amen? Amen? It's all about change. God didn't wait for you to get better and then send Jesus. That would have been super. That would have been, I'm not going to say the word, that would have been ridiculous, right? Think about this. I want to, I want to, I want you to think about this. Now, Teresa loves her truck, okay? <laughs> I'm going to pick on her a minute. She loves that truck. Now, if that truck broke down and I waited until she got it fixed to offer help, would that be any good at all? But that's the way we act with God. We act like God's waiting for us to get our act together. You know what I mean? Well, he is, but Lord bless your heart, he knows you're not going to. Amen? God didn't wait around for you to get it right. He found you right where you were, right in the mess that you made, right where, you know, you didn't want to belong. But you didn't have no choice. He found you right there, and he picked you up. Amen. That's what happens every time. That's the gospel. Not this other thing that people are preaching about. Just start doing better, brother. Look, doing better won't get you to heaven. Believing in Jesus Christ will get you to heaven. Putting your faith in what he did for you, that will get you to heaven. How many of y'all messed up this week? I'm going to hold my hand up. I know. You better that. hold both. Look, you better hold. <laughs> can't talk about both. I hold them both up. Look, we all, we all fall short. Every good thing that we can do looks like a filthy rag to God because we are not perfect. And if we're going to try to live our life by rules and regulations, Paul says that we walk away from grace when we do that. Amen. Hold on to grace. Grace teaches you. We've, we've talked about this before. Grace, not only do you get saved by grace, but grace teaches you. Titus chapter 2 tells us how, I think it's 517 actually. Anyway, Titus, you go look it up. Titus tells us that grace teaches us how to live for God. Amen? Romans uh I don't know how far I read. Did I read all the way to verse 19? I don't think so. No. Where did I stop at? Anybody know? Eight. I didn't really stop at eight. No, I didn't read one. No. Okay, much more than this being now justified by his blood, verse 9, we shall be saved from wrath to come through him. For if we were, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death, by the death of his son, how much more will we be reconciled and will we shall we be saved by his life? And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement. That's where we stopped. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. Remember. Uh, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Paul is showing them why we're all sinners. We're all sinners because the minute sin entered into the world through Adam, all of us became sinners, okay? Now watch this. For unto the law, 
uh, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over them which had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense or offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense one many be dead, much more than the grace of God and the gift of God by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded to many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemn, uh, to, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more than they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in his life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, the righteousness of one is the free gift come upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And that sums up everything I just read to you, that one verse. Verse 19 sums everything I just read to you up. If you want me to coin what Paul just said all there, it's right there in verse 19. For by one man, Adam, and his disobedience, everyone else was made sinners. So by the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, many are made righteous. Wow. And it's only through Jesus. Why, why is Jesus the only one that could have done it? Well, first of all, let's understand that Jesus was the only person who had ever lived completely sinless. Amen? Jesus never once broke any of God's commandments. How many of us would dare to even think that we kept half of them? Because, you know, most of us go, well, I'm not a murderer. So, um, you know, there's that. Are you not? Because Jesus said, if anyone hates their brother without cause, he's a murderer, right? Well, I've never committed adultery. You may not have committed the physical act of adultery. Okay, I'm talking to some ladies and I'm going to be nice, okay? But you know when... Uh, Russell Crowe or, or uh, Stop talking Jason about me. Statham or one of the other, you know, James Bond when he was younger, he was a handsome fella. The Bible says if I even look at a woman lustfully, I have committed adultery in my heart. Amen? Your pastor just failed too. Boom, boom. Why? Because we all are sinners. Amen? Jesus was the only one who ever lived that had not sinned. He was the only one that could have went to the cross and taken upon himself the sins of the whole world. Okay? Now, first of all, he didn't take upon the sins of this whole world just because he was a man. Because if a man would have done that, a man would have just died and stayed dead. But because he was God, he could take upon himself the sins of the entire world yeah. and wipe out our debt. Amen? It's the only reason he can be the only mediator between God and man. And I hate to tell all these wonderful preachers, even the Pope, Every one of them needed salvation at one point or another. Amen? Yeah. So they can't be the mediator. 
between God and us. Amen? John 10 and 10, Jesus says something very, very important. You remember, and you'll remember if I say this, when Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, he said, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be to find it, and broad is the gate. And broad is the way that leadeth unto death, and few, and he said, many there'll be to find that. Amen? So don't just run after everybody and say, oh, there's a whole bunch of people coming to that church. They must be right. The Bible doesn't support that. The Bible says, broad is the way, and crooked is the path that leads unto death, and many there be that find it. Amen? But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life. Why? Because, and you can turn your TV on right now. Every gospel that's being preached on TV right now is just to tell you how much money you're going to get and how God wants to bless you with a car and a house. And he wants to, it's like an auctioneer. Get it on, get it twice. Oh, I'll send your gift in for $29.95. I'll send you this healing cloth, and you'll have no more words. You know what I mean? They're preaching every day except the cross and him crucified. Amen? Jesus is the only way. Here we go. We're going to see it again. John 10, and we're going to start at verse 1. Jesus is speaking. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not in by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth over some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So every person that is trying to get to heaven any other way other than Jesus Christ, this is how God views them, a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the, she is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth to his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And the stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of a stranger. Now, this is a very important lesson. The Bible says that when you are born again, that his spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. Amen? So I'm going to challenge you, okay? How many of you in this room know that you know that you know that you are saved and you know Jesus? Okay? If you know that you know that you're saved and you know Jesus, raise your hand real quick. Okay? If you know you are, here's the thing. Watch this. Don't let nobody else tell you any different. There ain't nobody else ever going to be able to tell you, hey, Teresa, you ain't saved. They can't do it. They don't know her heart. They don't know the commitment that she had. They didn't watch the change in Teresa's life. Right? We got to understand that there's only one voice we follow. And a shepherd, if you ever learn anything about shepherds, they'll lead them sheep and they got that stick and stuff, but they'll hardly ever use that stick. They'll, tell, they'll talk to their sheep and they'll, hey sheep, come over here sheep. Up, up, up. And that sheep will just follow that shepherd voice. But if you or I was to walk out to them sheep and start saying, yep sheep, yep sheep, they run away because they don't know us. We're not the shepherd. Okay? Very important for you to understand if you're in Christ, he said, my sheep hear my voice. Amen? They know me. Amen? You don't have to worry about somebody else going, well, you need to get yourself together. Huh? You look right back at them and you tell them, you're working on your own salvation, huh? I'm glad Jesus saved me. I didn't have to do anything to get it. And I don't, get, I don't do anything to keep it. 
salvation. What do they call it? He said, anyone that believes in him will receive eternal life. It didn't say anybody who believes in me will receive life or partial life or eternal life except. It didn't say anything like that, did it? It didn't put a condition on that. The condition is his to meet and yours to believe. That's it. Amen. One more verse. <clears throat> One more verse. Huh. Romans 8, 34. I want to show you where this verse is. So the next time somebody gets all up in your business and they tell you how much you need to get yourself together and how you tell them, look, Jesus is praying for me. Because that's what this verse we're about to read says, okay? Romans 8, verse 34. Romans 8, 34 says this. Who is it that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who, and who maketh intercession for us. Now watch some very important words here, because Paul, all through Romans 8, is telling us. Look at the first verses of Romans 8. This is very important. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that be in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. And he spends the whole entire chapter 8 telling you how Jesus has paid all for you. And that you are freely forgiven, freely changed, and there's no condemnation on you. And then he tells you here in verse 34 that Christ is making intercession for us. And then he's, he ends with this, and this is what I'm going to end with. Now I want you to think about these questions as I'm reading them to you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake we are killed all day long we are counted as sheep for the slaughter nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am persuaded this is what I want you to be persuaded What's that word persuaded mean? It says I'm completely and utterly convinced in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, Amen. which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus doesn't save you just so that you can, one day you're saved, and one day you ain't saved, and one day you're saved, and one day you ain't saved. That ain't biblical. That's not true conversion. We've got all these churches teaching, oh, you know, just Oh, you weren't saved, and you hear people say, Oh, oh, I got I got saved, but then I backslid, so I can get saved again. The salvation experience is just like your birth experience. It happens once for real. It happens one time for real. You don't get saved and then all of a sudden turn into a new creature. You're brand new and then God just throws you away when you mess up. That's not scriptural. I would have to look at people who walk away from God and say, did you really know him? Did you really 
get what you think you got? What are you really, truly born again? Because I think we have a vast majority of people sitting in churches who may have had an emotional experience. They may have had some kind of intellectual thought process that said, ooh, yeah, this Jesus guy, that sounds like the right way to go. But it's not about your mind. It's not about you thinking your way to being saved. You can never just get enough knowledge and just be saved. It don't work that way. You can never just get emotional enough. And I don't care how many times somebody's been to the altar crying their face off. If they continue to walk back to the world, I'm going to look at them and I'm going to ask them, have you really trusted Christ? Have you really truly been born again because the Bible says that anybody that's in Christ is a new creature. Amen? You need to ask yourself that. Amen? I had to ask myself that. You understand that even as a pastor for years I just went through the motions. Just go through the motions. And it sounds funny, okay? It sounds almost absurd. But in 2015, I kind of feel like it actually took hold. Like really, 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 really took hold of me. Like I was really, really, really changed. Like something was different. And I had done all kinds of things in church. I'd already pastored two churches up to that point. But I was dead inside. Born again experience changes you. No matter what. No matter where you at. No matter what you were doing. When you really get born again. And you know the born again experience. We've kind of taken God out of the mix. Because the born again experience isn't just me praying a prayer. And it's not just me uh, turning my life over to God. Okay, that's, that, that's part of it. But the real part is when what happened to Peter happens to you. Jesus was sitting there with his disciples and said, Who do men say that I am? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Some say one of the other prophets. Some say, you know, Jeremiah or Elijah. And he said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter was the only one that spoke up that day. He said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said something very profound, and you need to understand it. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In other words, nothing that Jesus said, nothing that Jesus had ever taught, told Peter what he just heard. He said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And then we read in John 6 that no one can come to the Son except the Father draw him. And then we see that, that if, if we are, if we do come to God, it says, you know, he says, all that the Father gives me. This is uh, John 6 and 37. John 6 and 44 is the one that says, he that cometh to me, he that cometh to me, can, no one can come to me except the Father draw me. Verse 37 says this. It says, all that the Father has given me will come to me. And he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I just about bet you the only way you've heard that verse is he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. They leave off the part that the Father draws to him. John chapter uh, 10 we see Jesus talking to his disciples and said he that loveth me keeps my commandments and my father will come unto them. I and my father will come unto him and manifest ourselves to them. It's very important. The born again experience is not just me somehow giving my life over to God out of the blue. It's where the Spirit of God, where God the Father is working on my heart and He's changing it. And then all of a sudden, I'm, my eyes are open and I'm awake. And then I can look at God and say, yes, I want this thing called eternal life. Give it to me. Then, I, then I'm accepting it. But I, it's not just me somehow attaining and reaching up and just getting a hold of God. That's not the way it works. God 
gets a hold of you. Jesus looked at his disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Amen? And everybody that's ever been saved ever in the whole history of the church, not one of them did it themselves. True conversion happens when the Father reveals the Son to you. And you're born again. That born-again experience, the Bible says it is absolutely necessary to see the kingdom of God and to enter the kingdom of God. John 3 and 3, Jesus said, you must be born again or you can't see the kingdom of God. John 3 and 5, don't marvel that I say you must be born again because you must be born of water and of the spirit or you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. It is only through Christ and only through what Jesus did that any of us can be saved. Amen. The reason I started preaching these five things three weeks ago was that I have for five months had a burden on my heart to bring everything back to the gospel. To bring it back to Christ. That's who we hope in. That's who we claim. That's who we put our faith in. That's who we know saves us. That's who we know justifies us. That's who we know gives us entrance into the heavenly realm. Amen. We're only there because of him. We're only going to get there by him. Amen. Amen. These are fundamental things. That the church has believed for centuries that the American church doesn't preach. They just don't. They'll tell you about cars and mansions and how much God wants to heal you and how much God wants to do this. And Oh, they'll give you the Holy Spirit, but they don't want to give you Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to pray. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I know this wasn't the normal jump around and shouting kind of preaching that I normally do. But I think it's important for us to understand what Jesus did. Not only that, once I understand it, I'll be able to tell other people why I believe what I believe. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that today we heard about Jesus. God, I pray that if anybody's watching this video, God, who has been into intellectual or emotional Christianity and has not really surrendered their heart and their life to Christ, Lord, I pray that you use this message and these messages, God, to prick their hearts, their minds, and their consciences so that they could see their need for you. Father God, I know that you are drawing and wooing and bringing everyone who will listen unto the obedience of Christ. Lord, we ask that now that we have planted the seed and watered it, God, that you would cause the increase that those who hear this would know and believe and come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Let this day be the first day of their eternal life. Lord, we thank you, praise you, and we give you all the glory and all the honor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.